song. <coughs> Would you stand with us this morning? I just want to quote part of the 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So as we begin this new song, it's not a new song, but it's kind of new. Um, just think about what we need to be set free from this morning. Each of us are different, but that's why we come to the table. That's why we come and worship the Father and be set free. Amen.
all of our needs, Lord. There's nothing that's out of your vision. You see us for who we are. You see us, Lord. We are known by you. I thank you for that. Lord, we just give all of our hearts unto you this morning. Everything, Lord. Not one thing is hidden. And we can bring it all to you. We're so thankful for your grace, God. We're so thankful. Lift your hearts up to him this morning. And lay it all, all out on the table for him. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
How are we doing this morning? Good to be in the house of the Lord again. Amen. Now I'm amazed at what God does in life. So that video said that, that you just saw 200 faces and they were all in different needs. Correct? God was just showing me this morning that all those 200 people, including every one of you and beyond, now, I wish I had an ear tag to hand to every one of you, but he wants to leave the 99 and come after you. He went after, he wants to go after everybody in that video. And this morning, if you're outside of the 99, he's coming after you. See, far too long has the church stayed in the church and God said, you saw where it said that we're to be an image of God. It popped up there at the end. And, and if we're an image of God, we're going after the one. We're going amongst the streets. We're going into the places that aren't safe. We're reaching out for the lost. If you're here today, God wants to know that the word he's given to me today is consistency. God wants to see more consistency in your relationship with him each day. He wants to be your warm cup of coffee. He wants to be your cold Pepsi. He wants to have a round table discussion with you. And I was reminded that a lot of times you see the coffee shop and people are gathering there for fellowship and that's all well and good, but what if we took some of that time and gathered around a, a table in our kitchen early morning or sat on our couch or went for an early morning walk outside in the dark and just talked to Christ? God's asking for more consistency from you in that. God, God's wanting to say a whole lot more to each one of you. God's wanting to speak to you in that early morning hours. But he's wanting us to be consistently drawing after him like that cup of coffee. How many times have we all got out of bed and go, oh, Lord, I just need a cup of coffee right now. And we're craving it. Anybody else with me? How about if it's a cold Pepsi? Does anybody drink a Pepsi that early in the morning? I'm not recommending it, Justin, that you do. But God's saying just... Open that can of Pepsi and then sit down and talk to me, Justin. Sit, sit down and talk to me. We're leaving him out of our coffee conversations. God wants to be the conversation. I'm going to ask you guys another question. Because I, I mentioned it before that. And we don't know the day or the hour or the minute when Christ will return. But we do know that he will return. And he says that old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. And that's for women, too. Is anybody and I want you to raise your hand along with me right now, having dreams that, you know, are from the Lord. I'm not just saying crazy dreams that don't make sense. And you don't remember. Are you having vivid dreams where you're seeing people's faces? So we got quite a few hands up right now. You guys, as a pastor, I'm consistently having people come to me lately and, and hearing stories of how God's working through their life and dreams. And I'll be honest with you, just this week again, I had a dream of two more people, not the same person I talked about, that were very high up in politics. And I dislike these people very much. And God said, Troy, in that dream, but those are the two I want you to pray for. And he put them right before me in my face and I started to tell him about Christ. See, God's saying, Troy, you you have failed them because you've let your hate for what they stand for get in the way of teaching them about Christ. Troy, you 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 gotta forgive them and 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 teach them about my love. Now, I may never get the opportunity to see those people in person, but what's God telling me to do? 
He's telling me to pray for him. A lot of times, and, and it has no other meaning, but when somebody brings somebody's face to you in the church or in another church, he's just wanting you to pray for him that day. If God's showing you somebody, then you should be praying for him. And I believe that's happening more and more and more that God's speaking that way and saying, listen, I want to put this person in your heart and your mind and I want you to diligently pray for that person because I'm going to show Jack and Ladine this person and they're going to pray hard for this person. And then Justin and Maria, you guys pray for this person. Marcel and Gustavo, you guys pray for this person. So we're each focused in on somebody because Pastor Troy can't pray for all all those people diligently enough. Pastor Aaron can't pray for all those people diligently enough. Does that make sense? So the church has to become the hands and feet. The church has to be prayer warriors. Speaking about prayer warriors, speaking about being a warrior, you, you need to learn about your authority in Christ Jesus. Stop letting the enemy take ground from you. Just, just don't let him take it. You don't have to agree with what's going on in your life. If it's not from God, don't come into agreement with it. The enemy does throw circumstances at us that sometimes are out of our control. A lot of times are out of our control. But when we go to scripture and and we go to John 14, 27, if you don't have peace, you, you can say, Lord, in your scripture, you said your peace, you be with me, your peace, you leave with me. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not fear. And that's warring. You're warring against the enemy. You're taking your mind back. You're taking your heart back when, when you use scripture out loud. You're not letting the enemy take ground, so to speak, in your heart and your mind. You know, I, I'm, I'm this. I am so blessed and I know my wife's a part of this, but I'm so blessed to have that worship team up there. All you guys who serve this morning, all those who serve on worship or serve in the back or serve in the nursery. But I tell you what, it's it's hard to be up there. I, I, I would rather stand here and preach and talk the whole time that you guys do not want to see me on the drums. <laughs> I, I wish I knew how. I mean, maybe I need to have Kyle teach me. I mean, Kyle, you're you're in on that stage all the time throughout places, and it's you get nervous once in a while, don't you? Still, does it get it gets easier? But he has that gift. So when God gives you the gift to sing, to worship, it becomes easier. But you know what? I I'm proud of Virginia this morning. Because the enemy wants to cause confusion and he wants to cause disruption. And, and Satan was the head of worship before he was kicked out of heaven. So he will do anything to distract your mind and tell you that you made a mistake or tell you not, that they're not any good. But when she backed up and redid that song, that was one of the most powerful things. If you were paying attention in the spirit in your heart, surrender. And when she kicked her voice in and everybody else kicked in their voice around, was that not powerful? She took ground back by stopping and backing up and saying, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm going to kick Satan's tail. And he paid for that one because that was a whole lot more powerful. Do you see what I'm talking about? The enemy is going to try to strap you down and beat you up and hold you down and tell you that, oh, I made a mistake. And so, oh, man, I can't do this. No, you stand up like Virginia did this morning and say, everybody, hold it. We're going to back up and we're going to re-worship this and we're going to make the enemy pay for this. Amen. How many things in your life do you need to make the enemy pay for something? What's he stolen from you? Has he stolen your health? Has he stolen your finances? Has he stolen your kids? Have they gone astray and went their own way? Has he stolen your job? Has he stolen a friendship from an, a, an employee or someone else or a coworker? Galatians 6, 9 says, don't become weary in doing good. 
Don't become weary in doing good. And in due time, you will reap a harvest, harvest of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Who doesn't want to reap a harvest of righteousness? All good things come from the Lord. Amen. You guys, I'm trying to, to get you excited about what's. What God's doing. I'm trying to get you excited to see that far too long has the enemy said you got to be perfect. That's not true. We want to aim for perfection. But when we're not there, we don't let the enemy hold us down. I was reminded of of this uh, ratchet strap. We obviously keep them all the time in my line of work and we're tying mowers down and we're strapping stuff down. And when you don't, they come flying off the trailer. But imagine this strap being laid across you and the enemy's tying you down. And, and every time he puts something to your head, he's ratcheting it even a little bit tighter. Well, Trent, you messed up today. I heard what you said. Well, well now, you, now you can't leave youth group because you said that. Or, well, maybe we messed up a little bit and now we can't do this. Or maybe I stumbled it. And he makes it tighter, but he starts to tell you that God can't use you. And you start to the point where he straps you down so tight that you're not going to be able to move. It's not from God. You know what God does? He opens up the strap and he pulls it and he loosens it. And he sets you free. We're all going to continue to stumble and st stub our toe because there was only one person who walked perfectly. And that was Jesus Christ. Only one man didn't have sin. And that was Jesus Christ. And God sent him to, to loosen the ratchet strap on our life. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. We love you, Lord. And we just ask that you be here and continue to speak as we continue to worship you, as we continue to learn. I pray that you'll set us free and you'll teach us, God. You are the great physician, Lord. I pray that you'll bless your people that are watching from home, Father God. I know that you love them and love us so much. I pray that you'll expand the family of God today. In all the churches across America, I pray that they'll, they'll stand up and they'll preach the gospel. And, and I pray that pastors won't shrink back for fog machines and skinny jeans, God. I pray that they'll stand up and say, you know, this may make someone a little frustrated today, but they're still going to preach the word. Because Paul wasn't worried about that, neither should we. So send the Holy Spirit this morning as we trust you and we walk forward to be touched and learned by your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there's been a some of the things we talked about at the, at the Greg Moore conference that I was at was the gift of healing. It's one of the nine gifts of the spirit is the gift of healing. I, I constantly as a pastor am praying for people and getting emails of people that are sick. And when you get up those early morning hours or the last thing you think on, on your bed or when you're driving down the highway at work, I'm usually praying for somebody that's on that list. And, and it, God wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you physically and he wants to heal you spiritually. He wants to heal you emotionally. He wants to rid you of your depression. He wants to, to rid you of that broken heart of loneliness. All those things that deal with sickness are not from God. God didn't place sickness on his people. Satan does that. The one thing I want the church to hear, and this sometimes is tough, but don't blame God for your sickness. Don't blame God for bitterness. Only good things come from the father who loves his children so much and he wants to give them good things. 
only good things. And the enemy will, if you've lost a loved one in your family, the enemy sometimes will say, well, look, God didn't heal him. And I prayed and God didn't do this. God didn't do this. We did with our sin. We're, we're in an imperfect world and, and God's given us everything to be successful. And, and when you do good, then you create a harvest of righteousness. And when you focus on his scripture, you you start to have this weapon of healing for your mind. It says to have renewing of your mind in Romans 12, 2 and in John 14, 27. It talks about Jesus leaving us that peace that I talked about. See, God's given you peace. And in the book of John, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. If your heart's hurting today about something, God's saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus is perfection. Jesus is perfect. But sometimes bad things happen here because we're in an imperfect world. But God had a solution in the beginning and God had a solution in the end. And I want to show you these beginnings and I want to show you these ends. But I'm going to start with James, James chapter five. Verse 13 through 16. Now, this is probably the most familiar healing scripture in the Bible. And I just want to read this because we may start with this. We may end with part of this. But but go to verse 13. Chapter five. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him or her with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. Now, there's a whole lot there to break down. There's a whole lot there to take in. But but verse 13, it says, is anyone among you suffering that that's dealing with the hurting of the heart? That's dealing with not just physical sickness, but emotional sickness. And God says, let him pray. Let him have that Pepsi morning, that coffee morning with me and pray to me. And that heart of suffering, I will tell you through scripture, Troy, do not let your heart be troubled for in my house are many mansions. If ever not so, I would have told you, Troy. If there's anything you want to know, go ask God. If there's anything you want to know, go ask God. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something else. When God heals you, there's no side effects. When God heals you, there's no side effects. And every prescription you ever needed is between the covers, between these covers. Every prescription you ever need is between the covers. Now, that being said, God put doctors and scientists amongst us to bring healing as well. They're all after the same thing. Jesus brings our healing and God also brought doctors and scientists and when they work together, there's true healing. So you didn't stand up here and hear from Pastor Troy and say, well, Pastor Troy didn't say to go to the doctor. No, that's not what Pastor Troy said. Pastor Troy is saying that when God heals you, there's no side effect. But God also created those doctors with a loving gift, just like he created the worship team to sing. So the first thing you do is God says, before you go to the doctor, if you're suffering or you're hurting, you come to me in prayer. And if you have a cheerful heart, be thankful and remember to worship because God just healed you. And and now you just walk on back to work and you have a normal life. But God says, please, can you just stop and look up and admit that I did that for you and worship me and say, thank you. 
Too many times we just go right back to what we're doing the minute God brings healing to our life. God wants to bring healing to your life. Physician means a person who cures moral and spiritual illnesses. Or it's also a person who's qualified to practice medicine. But the first place we want to turn for our healing is scripture. And then God, God says in scripture in the book of James, he says, is anyone among you sick? Let him. You guys, and that's important. Let him call for the elders of the church. You make the phone call. Now, is there times where Pastor Troy calls people up front to, to have healing? And we may do that today if God so chooses. But when you come forward, you're making the call to say, Lord, I'm calling and I'm coming before the elders and the pastor of the church to, to, to be anointed with oil and find that healing. I think healing has become one of the hardest things to understand in the church. I, I think there's so many times that that we feel let down and so many times that we feel disappointed that we become bitter and we become frustrated. Am I right? We we just get frustrated because we read those promises and sometimes it doesn't happen and doggone it, I get mad. But what we need to remember is that God didn't create sickness. He's a perfect God and, and the enemy will keep crashing at you any way he can and he'll keep lying to you and he'll, he'll keep telling you false things. Don't become bitter at God. I'm going to share this again and I know the family wouldn't mind, but when COVID-19 first came out, when we lost a good friend in my boys. I can almost promise you that there was more churches and more church body people praying for that man in Barton County, maybe more than anybody that's ever been sick. I know people that were praying all night. I know people that were fasting. I know that people were specifically having worship times and just raising Mike's name before the Lord. God, you got to heal him. Look at all the people that are praying. And then he passed away. And my heart was broken. And then I became angry. And then I got the opportunity beside Mike's casket to look in his Bible. And there on a blank page that he wrote in his Bible, it said, Lord, I love you. Something like this. I'm not a perfect quote, but it said, Lord, I, I love you so much. And when you choose, I'm ready to go home with you. I am not afraid because I know what you've prepared for me. And if I become sick and tired, I don't want my life to be extended because I just want to go home with you. Did God answer the prayer and bring healing to his life? Yes, he did. Not in the way that Pastor Troy wanted it. But sometimes a person's will is to go home to be with the Lord. Sometimes they're in such a fight and such a sickness that their body becomes so brittle, so 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 losing their willpower and courage that they look up and they say, God, I believe what you said in the book of John that in my house there are many mansions. God was already preparing a mansion for Mike boys. And Mike said, I, I don't really want to be healed that way. I want to go home to be with Christ. Lord, the enemies made me suffer so much with this cancer that, that I, I just want to go home because I know it's going to be positive. Does that make sense? So we, we can't question God when someone's not healed, but, but we need to continue and do what Scripture says we should say it does. It says to call the elders. It says to pray for the sick. It says to anoint them with oil. We need to do what it says, even sometimes when it doesn't go our way. Because I promise you, I've seen times when people are healed instantly. And I've seen times when we prayed for somebody and a couple of weeks, weeks went by and then they were healed. 
And then I've seen times when we prayed for the doctor's hand to be guided and they were healed. And then I've seen times where somebody's went and got an antibiotic and they were healed. The bottom line is, is that God loves each one of you. And God isn't a respecter of persons. He wants to heal everybody. He didn't leave anybody out. When Jesus walked amongst the people, he was healing them of, of being paralyzed. He was healing them of being a leopard. He was healing their diseases. I want to show you something. And God, God really showed me this just this morning early when I was reading. And go to Genesis chapter 1 and start with verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over earth and over every creeping things that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Everybody say own image. So we were created in God's image. When Adam and Eve were created, were they sick? Was there anything imperfect in them? No, because because they were made in God's image. Everything was perfect. He created him male and female. He created them. Now look at verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was what? Very good. Very good. Wow. So in the beginning, God brought heaven to earth, so to speak. He did. And they were walking in the garden with, with no sin. They were walking in the garden with no illnesses. And everything was good. Don't we want to get back to the good? It was perfect. And then what happened? Sin. There was sin. God, God didn't create the sin. Adam and Eve did. Satan tempted, right? That didn't come from God because God's a perfect God. God's a loving God. He only has perfection. He only has what's good for you. But, but we did that. Thus, that's why there's sickness today. Adam and Eve hid from him in the garden and he said, why are you hiding? He said, because we're naked. He said, well, who told you you were naked? A few verses before it says they were naked, but they weren't ashamed. Sin causes our minds to think differently. It warps it. It makes our minds sick. God didn't create us for that. God doesn't create sickness. God doesn't want you to be sick. But sin brought sickness into the world. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. Verse 26. They'll have it on the board up there. Exodus 15. And I know I read from the New King James and theirs is a little bit different here. But Exodus 15:26 And said, "If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep his all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you." He's the Lord who heals you. But he said he would put none of the diseases on them. He was talking to Moses. And what was the requirement to be healthy? Now, I want, I want to back up and just say something for just one moment. Because we're stepping into sin causes sickness. But just because someone's sick doesn't mean there's sin in their life. Okay, you, you hear me on that correctly? So Pastor Troy isn't saying because you have cancer today, there's sin in your life. What I'm saying is some situations, sin causes sickness. There's a consequences to America's sins. And right here, this is what God's saying. If you 
give me your ear, Troy, and follow my Ten Commandments and follow what I set up, then there's certain plagues that I won't put on your land. Did you hear what God just said, church? If you follow my commands, America, there are certain plagues that I won't put on your land. Exodus chapter 3, verse 25. So shall you serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. What's this one say? So shall I serve your God. So in some, some Bibles or translations, it says worship the Lord your God. So where it says serve, you could also put the word worship. It's an act of worship. And it's an act of obedience when we're walking in God's statutes and his commands. We're worshiping him when we're, we give out cheerful shouts and we give praises when we when we do godly things and we spend time in worship, the glory is pulled down and, and he blesses your food and your water. He blesses your land. God is a God who wants to be worshiped. He's a God who's earned that. In Numbers 25, several places throughout the Bible there in Exodus, God sent sickness on the land for a discipline, judgment. Because the Israelites had fallen away and they were worshiping false gods, the gods of, of Baal Peor in, in Numbers 25. I believe that's where that's at. They were sacrificing their children in abortion and the plague come on the land. You guys, I don't know about you, but some of the toughest times of persecution may be coming to the church in America that we've ever seen if we don't stand up. Just this week, our very own government is working on passing a law called the Equality Act. Where we're basically saying sin in America, have your way. It's okay. If you think COVID-19 was bad, you've seen nothing yet if we pass that. If you want to know more about the Equality Act, I'll have Lori email it to you. But Franklin Graham just listed it out how we need to pray. And he explained about everything that was in there. This isn't about a political party. It isn't about any of that stuff. But, but when you read what men and women are doing against God, we should have great fear of what's coming. And I'm not trying to, to be doom and gloom. I'm also trying to create some excitement because God wants to heal your broken heart today. But he, he just laid that on me to where I barely couldn't even almost speak it. He wants us to stop this from being signed, from being passed. So, so what, how are we going to do that? We're going to pray hard. I want everybody to put that at the top of your. Put your family first and your and your grandchildren. You pray for your family first. But then I want you to pray for the evil things that God's trying to do right now in this country. And I'm not pointing fingers at at anybody. As a matter of fact, God, show me those people to pray for them. A pastor is going to be opened up if this is passed to so much persecution to what he can or can't do in the church is going to become unreal. And don't think that I'm joking. Read it. Go, go read the Equality Act. Go read what Franklin Graham sent out. 
So what, what, what I believe is going to happen, guys, is I know God's going to work a miracle. I know God's going to involve himself in this in some way. Because he's, I believe that the church has been praying. I believe that the church has been fasting and seeking after him. And I believe God's going to put a stop to some of these things. But if the church isn't praying and we become weary in doing good, we're not going to reap a harvest of righteousness. God wants us to reap that harvest. And that's why he just showed me that in my heart right now. Because he's saying, Troy, tell the church to pray. Too, too many churches aren't talking about these things. You guys, if it doesn't line up with scripture between the covers, then we shouldn't be for it. We shouldn't be for it. That's not Troy choosing our government leaders one way or another. And I know I've spoken out pretty hard. But it's been because of what's between the covers. And it's because the church is about ready to face some very difficult things. But I want to show you something else. Pull up Revelations chapter 21 verses 4 and 5. Revelations chapter 21. This is awesome. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he sat, then who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these for these words are true and faithful. Did you catch the phrase where he said, Behold, I make everything new. No matter what happens, this world isn't going to stay the same. No matter how bad it could possibly get. Just like in the beginning, God created everything and it was good. Remember that in, in, in Genesis in the garden, everything was good. God is getting ready to make things good again. He's getting ready to create that again. In his kingdom. He's taking us back to perfection. He's promising perfection. He's promising no more tears, no more suffering, no more cancer, no more depression, no more broken heart, no more arguing in the church, no more gossiping at work. He's ridding the world of sickness by creating something new. God has always been in the business of creating something new. He did it when he created the foundations of the earth in the book of Genesis. And he's doing it again in the last book in Revelations. He's creating something new. In the middle of the book, he brought his son, Jesus Christ, the new covenant and created something new. What is God wanting to create in your heart today? Something new. Worship team, if you'll come forward. God is a good God and he's a faithful God. Don't stop chasing after the things that scriptures say that you can have. God, God says that you can have healing and, and, and he will bring it to you. Don't let the enemy tell you that it wasn't real or, or that he tries to steal it from you. You know, I remember that one time I told you and I've had knee surgery before and God's brought me healing. And then my right knee was bad. And, and Pastor Dave, before he died, prayed over me and, 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 and I was healed instantly. And it wasn't long after that I stepped in a badger hole and the enemy tried to take it away from me. And I twisted it and felt everything pop in my knee. And the first words out of my mouth was, oh, no, you don't, Satan. And I took authority right there and I said, God healed that and you're not taking that from me. You know what? It's fine. I fell in all the way up to here and bent and fell over. And it's fine. 
But I chose the right words. I didn't go, oh man, I just tore all my ligaments in my knee again. I didn't even speak that out. Sometimes we're too quick to give up what God's already given us. God wants us in, in 3 John to prosper in all things, to be in good health. Just as our soul prospers. Remember that your soul should line up with what you believe. When your soul is prospering in the word of God and seeking after him, you find healing. And I'm just about done here. I wanted to share. I got these from Greg Moore. These, these didn't come from me, but there's. I'll just say them real quickly. There's 12 things, 12 keys in your healing. Number one, what you believe in your heart is what matters. Just like when I fill in the badger hole. I'll say that again. What you believe in your heart is what matters. Number two, Jesus took it for us. He took it to the cross. He, he bore our sicknesses in Matthew, it says. Number three, it's, it's your move. It's real faith that involves action. And Jesus told the paralyzed man to rise, get up and take your mat and walk. If, if the lame man would have said, I'm not going to be healed. I'm not going to be able to take up my mat. He would have continued to lay there. Do you think he would have been healed? No. But Jesus said, rise and get up and pick up that mat. It takes action. Number four, remember you're loved. God healed you because he loves you. When he sent his son, Jesus, he brought healing in your salvation. Number five, examine your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. You guys don't allow the enemy to bring junk to your mind and to your eyes. That brings sickness. Examine your heart. Number six, see yourself well. The other time that I was instantly healed from a sore throat and sickness, I was sitting in the chair and God gave me the vision and I could see it. And I was chasing after his shadow. I was imagining just King David resting in his shadow, being in his presence. And I remember trying to just envision stepping in that shadow and I was instantly healed. Instantly. Number seven, have aggressive faith. That's standing up for the word of God. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violence. Take it by force. We are in a spiritual battle. The enemy's out to kill, steal and destroy. But what Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. We must fight for that abundance. You guys don't have to settle for the deck of cards that's been handed to you. Ask for a new hand. Ask God to do you a new hand. Number eight, exalt the truth over the facts. Of course, there's always facts. When, when the x-ray says you got a broken arm, yes, you understand that. But then start exalting the Lord. God, I know that, that you can heal this broken bone. You can heal this broken arm. Exalt the truth over the facts. Number nine, surround yourself with faith builders. You guys, it's all about who you hang out with. Who are your closest friends? Are they people that pray for you? Are they people that will protect you? Are they people that will look out for you? Are they people that speak kind words over you? Are they people that speak good things over you? Have godly compassion. You should hang out with people who will pray for you, who, who will have compassion for you. Number 10, hear and be healed. Believe the word of God. Great multitudes came together and God healed all their infirmities. Number 11, dealing with counterattacks. Don't let your guard down. Be vigilant. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone he may devour. He wants to devour you. But when you plead the word of God and you declare it, the enemy has to leave. Verse 12, the last one. If healing does not manifest, then remember this. If healing doesn't come, Deuteronomy 29, 29, and Kenneth Hagin was talking about this years ago. The secret things belong to the Lord. Paul said in Romans not to become bitter, 
Nothing can separate you from the love of God. But when God doesn't heal the way you want, remember the secret things belong to him. And we will have a full and better understanding, just like my boys, when the time comes. I'm here to tell you today that God has you. He has you right where you're at. He has your home. He has your family. He has your church. He, he has your country. He's just asking you to do your part. He's just asking you to stand up and pray and fight and battle for what's in Scripture. That's all I'm asking you to do today is fight for what Scripture says. Don't back down and don't be afraid. The secret things belong to our God.
God is good, isn't he? All the time. Before I forget to mention it tonight, uh, Dale will be teaching apologetics again. Even if you haven't been and you want to come tonight for the first time, come. It's, it's so informative. You'll be teaching out of the book of Genesis again and walking through that. And I promise you, you'll learn something. And we, we do have fun. You guys, it, it, it wouldn't be right. I'm going to have the, the worship team continue to pray. It, it wouldn't be right if I didn't open the book of James and where it says, call the elders of the church and lay hands and pray for the sick because I know there's hurting people here today. If you're sick today or your heart's broken, you just need prayer. I, I want you to come forward. No one's watching. No one's, you, you don't need to be embarrassed. Because scripture says to get anointed with oil. Scripture says to, to, to lay hands on them and pray for them. If we don't do those things and we just read them, we're missing it. So I want you to come forward now. If, if, if you are waiting on a report, if you're, if you're feeling sickness and God's calling you to come forward, now is your opportunity to come, come meet me up here and find prayer. Can I have some of the trustees, if you're here, come forward, please? trustees will, elders of the church they'll lay hands on you I want everyone to close your eyes for a minute bow your heads I want you to raise your hand right now if, if there's something that's bothering you if there's something that's ailing you I want you just to raise your hand no one's watching if there's a sickness inside you that's hurting you. And, and God's telling me that, that there's somebody here and you're wanting to be set free. I just, if you've got your hand raised, I just want you to, you've now raised your hand. Now just step out of faith and come forward. Come up, come up to the front. And we want to pray over you. you know, just, just funnel in and stand up here and we'll pray. I'm going to get Marcella, will you come pray? Becky, will you come forward and pray with some of the ladies? Shut my mic down for a minute. Well, just a second. Here, here, I want to do this. I want you guys to envision something while they're praying. I, I want you to envision that you're at the, the throne room of God. And you're opening those double doors and you're going into his courtroom and his beautiful throne room. And, and I want you to, to see yourself walking in there. And I want you to kneel before him in your mind and lay before his feet. Because before Christ, before God, that's where the healing's at. So place yourself right there now. Go ahead and shut me down, Caleb.
You got me on, Caleb? There we go. Thank you. You guys, God is good, and he wants to heal his people, and he wants to give you a word that refreshes your mind and your heart. Too many times we just, we walk out of church, and we don't follow what scripture says, and people are hurting, but, but God just set people free. He just brought healing. Let's honor God in the things we say and we do this week. Now, Father, I just pray blessings over your people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.